Last March, I captured one of the strangest things I've ever seen on a storm chase. A pair of mysterious lights flying hundreds of feet around the vortex of a monster EF4 tornado. There was one question on everybody's mind after the video was posted. What was the light? Could it have been a camera artifact or a drone? Or was it, in fact, the headlamps to a vehicle? Just days after the event, I assembled a team of experts to determine if this was possible. Question, but is it possible? I think it's definitely possible. There were so many of you that commented on that last video with your theories about what the lights may be. So today we're gonna go through what we know and still don't know about those mysterious lights. We're also gonna discuss the final rating with one of the actual National Weather Service damage surveyors, as well as check back in and see how the community is doing today. But before we get into any of that, we're gonna rewind all the way back to March 24th, 2023 and detail how this tragic event came to fruition. A large, broad trough with an embedded jet streak would promote strong southwesterly flow aloft with rapid moisture infection at the surface. Forecast soundings showed a prime environment for strong tornadoes, but as is usually the case with these setups, the devil is in the details. The more intense left exit region of the trough kept clouds and overnight storms ongoing across most of Arkansas throughout the day, while the right exit region was pretty much devoid of convection, allowing instability to slowly build. A number of prefrontal confluence bands also began to set up across Louisiana as the afternoon wore on. While development was a little slow to get going, the Storm Prediction Center recognized the ripe environment in place and released an MD highlighting the risk for strong tornadoes should these storms continue to mature. I found myself inching further and further east on Interstate 20 as storms slowly gained strength. But once we arrived in Raysville, we had a pretty big decision to make. The cluster of storms was approaching the Mississippi River, and with limited crossings, we had to determine which side we wanted to intercept on. While the storm was starting to get more impressive on radar, it looked like it still needed time. We would push east to Vicksburg, Mississippi, and then jet north on Highway 61. Tornado horn. All right, let's actually go ahead and stop somewhere up here. The time is now 7.45 p.m. And we're situated about two miles south of downtown Rolling Fork. The storm has now crossed the Mississippi River and has an impressive velocity signature on radar. At this point, I'm straining my eyes through the darkness to try and establish storm features and structure so I can figure out the most likely location for this tornado okay, to I develop. Think it's, I think it, the area of interest is like over those silos, actually. So let's go north a little bit. Let's keep going. Oh, there might be something there. Oh, tornado, tornado. The tornado's growing in size and intensity at a rapid rate. We decide to hold our position just southwest of Rolling Fork as the tornado marches towards town. I've done my best to sync up the damage track with the video so you can see exactly how everything evolved. Oh, it's a massive wedge. The tornado is over open farmland at this time, mainly damaging telephone poles and uprooting trees. Tour North. Now numerous hardwood trees are being debarked and split in multiple pieces. The tornado's first EF4 damage.
All right, keep going, keep going. It's crossing right in front of us, just crossed. The violent wedge is now crossing road 826, and the EF4 damage has caused it two residences. RFD covers my lens with rain, so I occasionally pull it down to wipe it off. Just follow them, they know what they're doing. Tornado is now entering the southwest side of Rolling Fork, and the light in question has picked up. Oh, huge tornado right there. You can hear it. Stop the car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As the light disappears from view, we get our final glimpses of the tornado before it fades into the darkness. After this, we made our way back to Highway 61 and started going into what was Rolling Fork. And we hadn't gone through this town, so I didn't know how big it was. And at first I thought maybe the tornado had missed town or just kind of grazed it because I was looking around and I couldn't see um, a whole lot of buildings that were damaged. Then there was one specific lightning bolt that really illuminated the foreground. And I came to the horrific realization that the reason that I thought there was nothing around me is because everything that had once stood there was now just clumps of rubble. Everything was flattened. After that, we basically just said, all right, chase is over. We're gonna go see if there's something we can do to help. We figured emergency services would be not far behind. I saw there were clumps of houses, what looked to be houses at least, let's go there. And this kind of pattern continued for the next 45 minutes where we would just go house to house, we're pulling people out. Uh, the road that we were on was really, really badly damaged. In fact, most of the EF4 indicators from town came from those homes. It was probably 30 to 45 minutes before we really truly started seeing um, emergency services pull up in a capacity that was, you know, relieving. We had seen the local police officers going around trying to help, but they had taken a direct hit. So they were just as much in the dark as anybody else. Once there was finally enough of a presence there after about, I'd say an hour and a half or so, uh, we decided, all right, let's, let's get out of here. Let's remove ourselves from the situation and let the professionals take care of it. And we went back to Vicksburg and that's where we spent the night. The following day as we were making our way back to Oklahoma, another group of professionals was making their way to Rolling Fork. And that was the National Weather Service Jackson, Mississippi Damage Survey Team. They were heading to Rolling Fork to inspect the damage and try and assign this thing a rating. We, we, we spent a couple of days initially, like right after it happened. You know, we were hands on, really, really digging in. And we, and we worked with our, our colleagues over at NSSL who were actually doing a drone project at the same time. The damage surveys are very temporally tied, especially the bigger ones. Now, if we had a little EF0 or maybe low-end EF1 through a forest, those trees stay felled. But when you have a file trader through a middle of the town, understandably, things get touched very rapidly. Uh, and cleanup and, re and rebuild happens very, very fast. And so you have a very limited time to observe before uh, you know, the bulldozers start to disturb the, the damage seat. There are processes that go beyond the local office. Uh, fundamentally, the local WFO with the Weather Service has the final say as approved by their uh, regional directors. But before they get to that, the process typically involves you know, elicitation of experts. That is to say that we will contact uh, outside contracting engineering firms, we will contact other weather service offices, we will contact NSSL, for example, we will contact other groups with wind uh, analysis. A lot, a lot, a lot of folks get involved. Logan and team ultimately assigned the rating of EF4 with winds up to 195 miles per hour. This put the tornado just short of the EF5 threshold by five miles per hour. So what gave it the 195 mark? And the best answer to that is what did it give it the 200 mark if you imagine the storm having went through the heart of not a huge town but a larger town and it went through the heart of it 
And yet, we still did not find multiple instances of clearly EFI damage, even though it had a considerable opportunity to have created that scar through town. The Green Apple, I believe, yes, the Green Apple Florist, essentially a single family home that has been modified to build to be a floral shop and is slabbed to the ground and swept clean. Why not F5? Why not EF5? And two things really stuck out to us fundamentally for the consensus of why not EF5. One was this building, even though it was extremely, extremely destroyed, I mean, on its own, taken out of context, I think most people would agree this could be representative of an EF5 radio, the damage to that building. But it was adjacent to other buildings too, and they didn't quite suffer that degree of damage. So that context was a little bit of a head scratcher. And then we realized that the way the building was facing the front of this this store what, is a storefront, like you might imagine on a main street or something like that. So it had a lot of glass uh, display, if you will. And it had a gable roof that happened to be pointed, unfortunately for them, into the inflow. So it made it a little bit more vulnerable. And for that reason, without an immediately adjacent supporting context clue, like another, even if there had been even two of these side by side that had suffered the same fate, then maybe we could have had more confidence on that. But we didn't. And so that was another, you know, dead end point for us. It, but it was to that point that we were gotcha. very, very close. And this is probably about as close as you'll get to being across that threshold without making it. After surveys are completed and released to the public for major tornadoes such as Rolling Fork or Mayfield, online speculation typically begins, and it's not uncommon for people to criticize the National Weather Service. However, it's very important to understand the current rating system that they're working with. That's the question we get a whole lot. It's like, how can you be so sure that it was five miles per hour from F5, but not quite there? And the answer to that is, is, is we aren't. What the EF scale is, uh, is a damage scale. Um, and that's important. And I want to underline that a little bit this time we talk uh, so people better understand what we're talking about when we mean a damage scale versus a wind scale. We can only know what happened by what the storm did. Um, is it possible that it had winds that were stronger? Certainly. Fundamentally, we have to go by what impacts it had on the ground because that is what allows us to link it to the historical record. So now that we have a better understanding of the event and what took place, we can start talking about the lights again. Now, the first video was posted so quickly after the event, less than a week after the tornado, that we were still missing some pretty crucial information um, and some theories that really couldn't be dismissed yet. But now that it has been close to a year, there are two theories that I can pretty quickly dismiss based on the information that we have. The first one was, could this be a drone? And one of the reasons this was talked about was because of my friends in Storm Chasers, Adam, Lucy, and Stephen Jones, mentioning it while they're filming the tornado. They're kind of bewildered watching this light go around and they're saying to themselves, well, could this be, could this be a drone? Yeah, what is that? And now, a year later, we can account for just about every single storm chaser that was there, and none of them were operating a drone at the time of the tornado. People did operate a drone afterwards to film damage, but there were no drones operated by storm chasers while the tornado was ongoing. The second thing I saw a few people mentioning was, could this be an accident, something wrong with the camera, an artifact and the sensor, something like that. And we know that that's not the case, one, because of what I just said earlier, people saw it with their eyes. Storm chasers saw it with their eyes. Multiple storm chasers captured it from different angles using different cameras. So it's not like it was just a glitch or something going weird with the sensor or light refracting in the lens. This was an actual object that was rotating around the tornado. So that leaves us with the leading two theories, which are either the headlights to a car or some type of battery powered high intensity LED light. And the first thing I wanna do is go and actually dive deep into the video. I wanna look at frame by frame what was going on because that's gonna tell us some things before we can start moving on and looking in the damage survey for any clues or indicators, as well as looking at what rolling fork looked like before the tornado to see if we could find anything that would match those descriptions. All right, so now we're looking at the raw video clip. The only things I've done here in my editor are trim it down a bit so we're just looking at the sequence with the light as well as turn down the audio some so that it's not distracting. But we're gonna just kind of play through this here for a bit of context. We are currently looking northeast towards the tornado. You can see that dark silhouette and the tornado is entering the southwest side of town. 
and that's where it initially picks up the light. The light kind of emerges on the northwest side of the tornado, and then as we press play here, we see it starts to rotate around, goes around the south side of the tornado, wraps around the east side. Here, my camera gets pulled down so I can wipe some of the rain off of my lens, and as I pull it back up, the light re-emerges on the north side of the tornado. It's gained quite a bit of altitude, and it continues doing another revolution around the vortex. Now I want to point some things out that relate to a couple comments that I saw very frequently on the video. The first one states that people could see certain frames where it looks like there's two obvious headlights. There's two lights right next to each other. Those have to be headlamps. Therefore, it's a vehicle case closed. The other argument sort of countered that saying, hey, when this video is played, it seems like the light is always facing the camera. It never seems to face away from it. Therefore, it doesn't seem like it'd be a vehicle. It seemed like it'd be some sort of light that's emanating 360 degrees. And I believe that the answer to both of those questions or both of those observations may be somewhat similar. And it has to do with my shutter speed. Now, the shutter of the camera is basically like the eye of the camera, and you can control how long that eye is open. And when it gets dark outside, you need to keep that eye open for longer to allow more light to come in so that you can see more. You can see more of what we're doing. So that can do a couple things. It can create some kind of funky light streaks and trails and whatnot, and it can also make it so it looks like there's always a light there even if the light is kind of tumbling around and it's going back and forth, because that shutter is open for so long, the frame will actually have the light still in it, even if it is facing away. Now, if this doesn't make sense, or if you're having a hard time visualizing it, I can actually do a practical example of this. But before we do that, I wanna kind of zoom in here so you can see maybe a little bit better what I'm talking about. If I really crop in here and go to where the light is, and start clicking through this frame by frame, you can kind of maybe see what I mean about the light being streaky, having trails and catching up to itself. So I'm going here frame by frame and look, there's one where it almost looks like there's two individual lights, but watch what's kind of happening here. See how it gets bigger, smaller, then there it's almost like a line. There's the two lights again, and it's just kind of doing this weird streaky thing there's a few frames coming up here that show it really well. There you can see just that long streak. Now that is likely due to my shutter speed. And also the fact that this camera is handheld, it's not on a tripod, so I'm moving up and down. That's causing more motion, which makes it even more chaotic for this individual light source with this slow shutter speed. So see, see right there, there's a good example of kind of the streaky light trail. This is what you're gonna see in my example. Now it's gonna be a bit more obvious in my example because I'm much closer to the camera for it, but let's go ahead and go into my office. I'm gonna set up my camera, turn off the light and get out the flashlight on my phone and show you what I'm talking about. With my shutter speed here at a 60th of a second, things look pretty normal. The light just kind of goes back and forth as you would expect. But now if I drop my shutter speed down to a 10th of a second, we can start seeing these streaks and light trails as I'm moving it back and forth. Now, if I take this a step further and attempt to tumble my phone, do a 360 where at a point the actual flashlight's not facing the camera, it almost kind of looks like the light never goes away. And if we take this back into the editor and start going frame by frame, we're gonna see something that looks a bit similar to what we're seeing in the tornado video. Note how the light starts looking like this, but as I start to move it, we get our first kind of obvious light streak there. And as I start flipping it, you can see the light is facing away from the camera at this point. The light of the flashlight is facing towards me, but we still see that streak there. And then if we go another frame or two, we can see that streak is now over here. So that can almost show you right there how it could look like there could be two lights right next to each other if this were much further away. Even though it's just the same light, it's just catching up to the frame. And also, even when the light is facing away from me, there's still some type of streak there. Because even if the light does tumble some, the frame is still gonna have a little bit of that light left in it. Now, of course, we can't say anything for sure. This is just an educated guess on what we're looking at based on the analysis by myself and others. But here's a couple good frames coming up that look similar to our example. You can see here, we have the light as one, then as a shake in the camera happens, it gets pulled apart like this. And then we go back to just one light there and the streakiness. 
I think this is a factor of the light itself moving at a fast pace, the camera shaking up and down, and those slow shutter speeds. So while the shutter speed explanation doesn't get us any closer to finding out what the light actually is, it's still an important discussion to be had. The next most logical place to look is in the damage itself. I reached back out to meteorologist Logan Poole to see what they found during their survey. We looked precipitously. <laughs> uh, that first couple of days, like I said earlier, was, you know, we were hands-on, really, really digging in. Um, we were looking for things like lofted cars. We even took the drone imagery from the NSSL teams and we were, you know, looking for anything that could be represented. We Still to this day, I'm not certain what the lights were, and, but I, I wouldn't say it's closed book either. I, I'm, I'm very uh, persistent and I have a sort of sort of tenacity for this sort of thing. So it's still open. Sure. And if anybody has anything they would like to come forward with uh, that may help shed light on that, then, you know, uh, myself and the team here are always willing to listen, even now. My next thought was to scour Google Earth on Street View to see the southwestern sides of town and go up and down all the streets that were available and see if I could find other types of vehicles or maybe some type of lamp mounted somewhere. I wanted to see if there was anything else that made sense. I literally spent hours going up and down every street that I could, zooming in on as many properties and things that look suspect, especially on the southwest side of town where it's believed the light originated from. While I did find some things like golf carts and ATVs, most of them didn't even have headlamps, and the ones that did were small halogen bulbs that likely wouldn't be bright enough to emit that much light. Also, most of the street lights in town were hooked up to some type of wired power source, and they didn't appear to be bright enough to be the light in the video. And so, with no new leads, nothing conclusive from the weather service, and nothing definitive from my research, unfortunately the mystery of the lights, a year later, remains just that mystery. Myself and many others have spent a lot of time trying to figure this out because like so many of you, we're curious. We want to know what the light was. But at this point, I think my time and energy is better spent reaching back out to the community, trying to connect with some of those individuals and see how things are going. In fact, on that note, do you remember that damage indicator that Logan was talking about from earlier in the video? The green apple florist? This is the damage indicator that almost rated the tornado in EF5. I wanted to reach out to the owners to hear what the night was like from their perspective, as well as talk about the recovery efforts still ongoing in the town a year later. My grandmother opened it and it was originally like a hobby shop. So it was framing, hobbying, and then um, my mom extended it into gift and floral. And then we continued with gift and floral. I did not know that a storm was coming. We were watching TV and my mother-in-law called and told us that we needed to watch the weather, that a bad storm was coming. Within two or three minutes, they were saying a tornado was in Rolling Fork. So I called some friends and start, we everybody started reaching out saying, you know, you need to take cover. Um, but while I was on the phone with my friend, her house was already hit. And it, it never even crossed my mind to check, check on my business. But you know, when you know people are hurting and people are in trouble, your, that's your first thought is to get there. So I was actually out at the prom area with my son and of course all those kids. And um, we had known that there was gonna be bad weather. Of course, nobody knew it was gonna get that bad. There was talk of canceling prom. We all decided with parents and principal that we would just go ahead and do it. We would watch the weather. We had gotten a phone call that, you know, someone's house had been hit. We still really didn't know. We're just thinking it had bounced around, you know, touched down here, there and everywhere. So we tried to continue with prom just to kind of keep their minds off of it. And then of course, more phone calls kept coming in and more text messages and people. My son, of course, who's on Snapchat, sent a snap to somebody and said, you know, have you been by the Green Apple? And they said, yeah, it's gone. I don't know if you know, like around Houston, Mississippi, which is about probably 20 to 30 minutes from Starkville, Mississippi, they found paperwork that has my handwriting on it. Um, it, it was so everywhere. that's pretty incredible. So after the dust settled, did y'all know you wanted to rebuild right away or was it something that took a little bit of time? I'm the emotional one. So I basically just cried for weeks at a time. I mean, of course I cleaned up, did all that, but I was trying to process it all. I mean, we had, it's a lot building a business and getting it up and running. Yeah. And we did that seven years prior. So I knew exactly what it was going to take to get to that point. And that was my fear. But it was, it was going to be a lot harder, but I mean, like Saturday morning, Sunday, I was like, all right, so when are we going to meet with builders? <laughs> you know. So I, ironically, it turns out when I got into town, the 
parking area that I stopped at before we got out and went over to the neighborhood was the parking lot for the Green Apple, but I just didn't know there was anything there because of how badly it was damaged. Um, what's, what's town looking like now? How is the rebuild going? street that you were just talking about that behind us they have beautiful homes going up it looks great yeah. they're fixing to start another one mm -hmm. it looks really good so highway 61 we've rebuilt service lumber their trucks are just about open jennifer Britton. so a lot of the businesses are up and a lot of homes are going up all over town but yeah. we still don't have anything downtown being built um so that's that's scary yeah but we I mean, hope it starts soon because um, we're almost a year in. What about you guys uh, more specifically? Is the Green Apple back and functioning again? We're fully functional. I mean, we've got some little things here and there that, you know, the builders have to fix. But other than like waiting on things to be done, no, we're, we're in. We've been in since the week after Thanksgiving. So we did get to go through the Christmas season, which was right. crucial for us. We needed to be in. You're kind of starting to feel a little bit of normalcy, but then you kind of still walk out the doors and you're like, eh. You know, it still it looks was like this. The yeah. little supplies. I mean, we were, oh, we need this. We need yeah. this. It just was never ending. But I feel like finally we're there. Yeah. What are the ways, uh, storm chasers and uh, eventual viewers of this video, what are the ways that we can help Rolling Fork today? There's still lots of ways to donate. There's still lots of things to do. There's lots of volunteers that are coming from up north that are staying for two and three weeks at a time and helping build homes. But it's kind of like everybody said, once everybody's gone and the newness is, is over, it stops. You know, the food stops, the, which, I mean, we are getting back to, you know, some normalcy of having places to eat and things like that. But there's just trees down everywhere. It is a long way it's, it, it's a lot. Well, Lacey, Amanda, I want to thank you so much for your time. I hope not to see any of y'all anytime soon, unless it's to visit. I see you unless it's just <laughs> yeah. to come visit. <laughs> All right, everybody, that's going to do it for this video. I want to thank you so much if you made it all the way to the end and if you donated to the Green Apple or if you can go and help any other organizations. If there's still some ongoing, I'll try and find the links and put them in the description or a pinned comment. If I hear anything about the lights in the future, I will be sure to make a video about it. But at this point, I'm just going to chalk it up as one of the strangest things I've ever captured in over 15 years of storm chasing. Thanks again so much for watching, and I'll catch you all out there on the next one.